Okay. Whatever events in history or scholarship were responsible for her disappearance, one psychological fact dominates the horizon of her departure. It is evident from contemporary feminist and theological scholarship that the she part of her, the fact that she was always personified as female, was problematical, very problematical, for the male theologians of antiquity whose pronounced misogyny is clear from their writings. Perhaps, you can read about this in Dan Brown, those of you who don't have a background in this, read the um, Da Vinci Code. Um, okay. Perhaps the presence of a playful, joyful, feminine being who is present with God at creation in the Proverbs uh, description triggered revulsion in the hearts of these males who vested themselves with the authority of ensuring the absolute power of only one supreme, jealous and angry, quite irritable, uh, angry male deity. And those of you who want a list of all the atrocities committed by this god, the millions of innocent people, I have a list of those, but it's too lengthy to go into in this very short presentation. That'll be up on my website very soon. Sophia was, and, and those of you who, do know, who, who, can, who, who are picking up the rather obvious misogyny, I'm going to correct that later because I have to tell you this really incredible intuition I got. So. You know, it, it didn't have to do with misogyny at all. It had to do with something else. So it wasn't, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't any plot on the part of males, because that's something that we women, and particularly feminists, do. We internalize that oppression, and then we blame the men, and thereby giving them power. Men didn't do anything. They're just, they're just doing their thing. You know, they're creating these literary devices and all of that. So very quickly, I want to give you, and this will sum up the um, academic part of this, the left brain part of this, um, th this is the summation of the scholars who studied wisdom, okay, um, and um, uh, made comments, summarized what the problem of wisdom uh, was for them. Now, get this: you have the you have the development of monotheism that came from the prophets and the rabbis, you know, um, from you know ar around 500, 600, 700, you know. The, the Jews were all over the place. They had goddesses. They all shared their goddesses and everything. Well, with the, with the prophets and the rabbis, there, there developed an increasing monotheistic tendency. And they burned down the trees, the asherah, the, the sacred groves of the goddesses. And they became more and more constricted and restricted to this monotheistic notion, getting rid of the, getting rid of the associations for their tribe of the relationships with the goddesses in the ancient Near East. Okay, so... Um, so this is this is a summary of, of this. So so here's so here's the deal. In Judaism, there was there was a tradition of studying, you know, what the what the prophets said, what the revelations were, and what the rabbi, what the rabbinical tradition was, and they could identify they could identify a development from the prophets and to up to the rabbis and up to the whatever present time it was, you know, this, we're talking about the post-exilic period around, you know, between 500 A.D., and, you know, the centuries before that, and the compilation of Proverbs was 500 years before the Common Era. Okay, so now the problem with wisdom, of, and, and these five wisdom books are in the Bible. They're called the five wisdom books of the, of the, um, of the, live, of the, um, of the Bible, and they're all listed again on my website, all of Ecclesiastic, Syrac, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiasticus is the Catholic version of Sirach and uh, Solomon. Okay, so here's their conclusions. Okay, number one, no one in the history of scholarship has spoken to the question of the emergence of the figure of wisdom. Okay, that's scholar number one. Again, I've got these all referenced on my, you know, all the, all the details you can find on my website. Wisdom is also an enigma to scholarly research. Although there have been numerous studies of wisdom, we have no clear con conception of her identity and origin. To answer your question, this is now this is all this, everything I pulled out of all the scholarship. The third scholar said, one of the most thoroughly debated problems in the whole of the wisdom literature is where wisdom is a personified entity imminent in creation. The fourth one. Conclusion, with the increasing number of scholarly works in this field, the concept wisdom has become increasingly unclear, and there are already Orientalists 
who have completely excluded it from their sphere of investigation. So she was dropped. She was just dropped. The fifth one is, um, it, uh, I strongly suspect Job of being an attempt to get rid of the awkward personality of wisdom. Now, she doesn't fit. She's a problem. She's excluded from mainstream monotheism. How many of us have been excluded from our, you know, <laughs> from our profession because we're interested in sacred uh, geometry or, you know, esoteric <laughs> subjects? So I got really hooked on this. I got really, really hooked. And, um, and so, you know, now to divert to the right brain here, to give you a little bit of the background of this, I have to tell you this because this is really critical. I did not choose Sophia as an image. I was always very interested in the goddess figures. I've been involved in spiritual studies meditation from, since 1971 and studying all this stuff, studying philosophy formally at Wisdom's Goldenrod. My family has a, a Buddhist center there where the Dalai Lama came. So I studied Neoplatonism and philosophy there. My, I have a list of my teachers if anybody wants to know, but I won't go into that now. All right, now, and my husband died in a very, very violent uh, tragedy fire in 1985. This Actually, this month is the 25th anniversary of that of that uh, horrific event. Within 24 hours of his death, I began to get images floating up. Now, I had had mystical experiences, and I had, I, had, I had been obsessed with the problem of the one and the many, you know, for years, like in 1971. This was, this is a passion. To anybody who's into philosophy will know what I'm talking about. The passion, my, I had a passion for the one and the many. Okay, that's an aside. So anyway, so my husband dies in this terrible death, and these images start to arise, okay? Um, and which uh, eventually evolved into a picture of um, this. I was actually eating lunch. These were dreams and daytime visions. This is, a, this is a picture, of course, of the horizontal eight found everywhere. These were found. This picture was called the owl's eyes. They were found on statues of Athena as, you know, generations, thousands of years, you know, um, where these mysteries were performed. Um, these were on statues of Athena long before the, um, you know, before the, Later Greeks sent their gods up to Zeus in heaven and all that. You know, there were these. Um, this is, of course, the infinity symbol, the uh, image of chaos on the computer. So this actually appeared to me. I was eating lunch. My kids were in school. Philo Sophia. This was a couple years after my husband had died. Philo Sophia. And then I found that later in Jung. And so that's when I, um, you know, began to really sort of, you know, um, I, I went to the Jung Institute Library to research this. So every image that I got immediately within 24 hours of my husband's death, which is all articulated, I, I described in all this, all this again is on my website, so I'm, I'm only going to give you the, the, headlines, the, the headlines of this. So um, um, I, I have to tell you, if I were to choose an image of the goddess, it would be Kali with the belt of skulls around her belt. First it would be Isis, you know, who knows the secret name of Ra. It would be Isis, queen of heaven who is a wisdom goddess, who is intact. It would not be this pale Sophia who is just kind of a product of, you know, Judaism and Christianity. It would be, it would be a much more powerful goddess that I would want to inhabit, not Sophia. But I have to tell you, because this is really critical, that the image arises in our life, and you, there's a relationship that occurs between your faculty of understanding, to use a Neoplatonic term, between your desire to understand the tragedies and the pits and the terrors and the tragedies of your life, the betrayal, the loss, the abandonment, whatever, and a dialectic ensues, a relationship ensues between an image, and that image becomes an organ of vision. There's a dialectic that is possible between these images. Let's say yours is justice. Let's say, you know, I have a friend who's battling Justice, you know, she, all, very great, uh, n n wonderful friend of mine who runs a philanthropy. So, so these images choose us. Okay, she's, she, you know, they arise. I have dreams and images. I seek her out and do the research. So it, there's a dialectic between the between the images that arise and the research that I subsequently do. And of course, in that process, synchronistic things happen, and books drop into my lap and people give me books and then I'm on this 13 year search and the number 13 is very significant. I was 13 years at Wisdom's Goldenrod studying Neoplatonism and then 13 years in Hades, uh, you know, actually literally following my husband, you know, down trying to understand why he died that horrible death. 